Hi, Vinyl community. I would like to welcome you to another episode where I am joined by my friend Chris Profi from Chris Profi Musically Obsessed. Make sure you check out his channel, but you're probably already subscribed. But if not, definitely check Chris out. Chris uh, is kind of to join me for another episode. This time we are going to be ranking Pink Floyd's top 10 songs by our uh, own preferences. Um, Chris, do you want to talk a little bit about what first got you interested in Pink Floyd or what your first Pink Floyd purchases were, maybe? Sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, so thank you again, Jeff, for having me on. This is great. I've uh, been excited to do this. And uh, so let's see, what got me into Pink Floyd? Well, I remember, uh, you know, it seems like my story with the monkeys. I remember hearing, uh, you know, Pink Floyd and seeing Pink Floyd on MTV when uh, Momentary Lapse of Reason came out. That was like how I got into Pink Floyd with songs like Learning to Fly and Dogs and, you know, that. And then for whatever reason, I don't know how I stumbled upon this album. I was trying to remember, but Pink Floyd Relics. So, I mean, talk about a total difference. Like Momentary Lapse of Reason is totally different than this album. Um, and I remember liking this more than Momentary Lapse of Reason. I like the spaced out sounds on here. This is still one of my favorite Pink Floyd records, even though it is a comp. Um, so then this got me to kind of explore the rest of their catalog. And I, you know, as a kid, never hearing Pink Floyd before, definitely like nothing I had ever heard. And I remember just, you know, not to sound cheesy, but the music definitely takes you on a journey. And um, I just remember sort of just a magic about the music. And, um, you know, cause it was so different than what you would hear on the radio. So yeah, Momentary Lapse of Reason and Relics were my first two uh, exposures to Pink Floyd. Yeah, for me, uh, my dad's name, his actual name was Floyd. And oh, okay. I always say that his favorite band was Pink Floyd. And he had two albums, he had Dark Side of the Moon and he had the wall and so yep. I grew up you know listening to dark side of the moon um the wall you know i'd sit there with the lyric sheet and just kind of read along as the song yep. were playing and it wasn't until i was much older and kind of like you I, I started to discover i think metal was the earliest pink floyd album that i discovered and mm -hmm. then i kept going farther back then i went to you know, obscured by clouds, and then I went to more, and then I started getting back to like Uma Guma, and finally yeah. discovering the Sid Barra era stuff. But um, you know, we there's so many different phases of Pink Floyd's career, like you and I were talking about off camera earlier. You've got the right. Barra era, which is you know their psychedelic 1967 uh, early mm -hmm. stuff. And then you've got that transitional period where they were trying to get out of Sid Barrett's shadow, figure out what they were going to sound like. And then you've got the right. Dark Side of the Moon, which is sort of that Roger Waters dominated series of albums with yep. Dark Side of the Moon, Wish You Were Here, Animals, Wall. And then what many people consider a Roger Waters solo album, The Final Cut. And then you've got the post Roger Waters era, which is Momentary Lapse of Reason and Division Bell, and then a couple of live albums. And then if you count the, you know, the Endless River, uh, you know, that's really sort of where their journey ends. But right. um, I think we're going to have uh, an interesting episode here because I'm sure our lists are going to be uh, very different. Um, yeah, well, like I was telling you, this was very difficult. Um, you know, they, had, as everybody knows, their catalog is, is, huge and um so and with all the different eras it was it was it was definitely tough i mean i definitely had some songs i wanted to put on here but then there were a few where i kept going back and forth i actually made a spotify playlist and i was like <laughs> listening to them and you know changing things it was fun but it was a lot of work but i've been training for this since i was <laughs> jeff so well, good i've got faith in you yeah yeah we can do this so even though we're going to do a top 10, like we did with our monkeys episode, we've got five honorable mentions just to make it yeah. a little bit just to ease our conscience a little bit about our list. And so yep. if you want to uh, give your list first, Chris. Sure. Yeah. And, and these aren't in any sort of order, but I'll tell you my five honorable mentions. I almost put the title track for Adam Hart mother on here. 
but I was listening to it in the car with my kids the other day and I'm like, it's a lot to take in and it's almost one of those songs that I, I don't know if it's a top 10, it's, it's just, it's almost an experience. So it's, it's, it's more than a song. So, but it's, it's an amazing song, uh, but it, it almost made the top 10. Um, I got to go with Arnold Lane too. One of the early songs. I mean, that's just an amazing song. Um, I love the imagery in that song. And uh, I have always loved Set the Controls for the Heart of the Sun, that bass line. That's just, and I think they do a live version of that on uh, Uma Guma. Yeah. Which is really good. Um, I was going to put in, and this, and this one I think I just took off today. I took this off the top 10. Um, Welcome to the Machine off of Wish You Were Here. It's just a great song. I love um, the keyboard work in that song. And then my last one is um, See Emily Play. Okay. I've always loved that song. So yeah, Adam Hart Mother, Arnold Lane, Set the Controls for the Heart of the Sun, Welcome to the Machine, and See Emily Play. I mean, those are great songs. They could have very easily switched spots with something in here, but yeah, I had to take them out. No, that's... Uh... That's a great list. And I've got two of the same ones, ironically, on my oh, yeah? Yeah, on my honorable mention. I've got C Emily play also. One mm -hmm. of my favorite parts is at the at the end of the first verse where it just like that speed it up, that little dee -dee 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 -dee. Oh yeah, the little piano part. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'd always love to like on vinyl slow that down and listen to like how it sounds. Yeah. Or what? Yeah. Not to sound regular speed, but yeah, I always love that. I love Arnold Lane too, although it didn't make my honorable mentions. But that their first single, uh, I, I love that. It's one of my favorite Sid Barrett songs. But um, I also Welcome to the Machine. I think is great. You know, just that whole synthesizer, the industrial. Um, you know, did you have that in your honorable mention? Welcome to the Machine. I do. Yep. Oh, yeah. Three songs. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, I, you know, maybe our list might be a little more uh, common than we thought. Yeah. My other two are uh, What's of the Deal off of mm -hmm. Obscured by Clouds. I really okay. like that. It's kind of like a gentle, acoustically strummed uh, David Gilmore uh, showcase there. I really like that track a lot. And yeah. then um, I went with... And it's hard because with some of Pink Floyd's stuff, you could argue, well, is it one song or is it a suite? But I had yeah. to include Shine On You, Crazy Diamond, part six through nine. Okay. I've always, that's always to me just been one song, although I know it's technically broken up into parts, but I really love the end of that. And when I first heard Wish You Were Here, I always thought at the end, it just sounded very dated and kind of hokey and like I just I but I it's grown on me and right now yeah. it might you know I don't know I, I just really like how that ends it's mostly there's very little in the way of lyrics there but it's just different instrumental passages different right. uh, rhythms and tempos and at the end it's just kind of Richard Wright and his keyboards and this majestic little keyboard, uh, right. you know, melodies that he plays, but I, I had to stick that on this list somewhere and it just made it to my honorable mentions. I've always loved that song. I kind of just wish they would have kept it together though. Yeah. I, I think it it loses something broken up. Mm -hmm. I think it's actually, and I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but I thought on one of their later compilations, they put them all together Oh, did they? Yeah, I could be wrong. I don't know. I know I've e I've either seen it on a compilation or I've downloaded it where it's all you know one complete right um, song. But um, so anyway, so all right, our honorable mentions. We uh, that's crazy that we had three. I have a feeling. Yeah, I think you and I are going to have some of this. We have similar interests as far as like music. I think. The way we go, I think we have similar soundscapes that we uh, go to. So, yeah, um, exactly. If that makes sense, but yeah, no, no. Um, so let's start with our number ten. Okay. Uh, what is your number ten? My number ten. Yeah. So with my list, I you know I tried to 
tried to represent as many eras as I could of Pink Floyd, but you know, there were just certain albums that I'm not gonna put songs on for. And it's not because I don't like them, it's just that they just don't do anything for me anymore. So this this might be uh, an interesting choice for some people because I know some people don't uh, you know, consider this a uh, true Pink Floyd album. I think this is underrated though, this album. I, I really, really like it. Um, it's mellow and it is like a Roger Waters solo album because Richard Wright's not even on this album. Um, you know, Gilmore plays some, some stuff on here. You know, um, I think Nick Mason just did like some sound effects and things on here. So it, it really is kind of like a Roger Waters solo album, but I still consider it Pink Floyd. I'm going to pull the title cut off of here, the final cut. I've just always loved that song. Um, in the beginning when he's like, through the fish island, it's just sort of the, the way it starts. And then Gilmore just does a blistering solo towards the end. So my number 10 uh, could be controversial, but I'm going with the title track off this album. I had to yeah. represent this album. I like it. I, I like it. I do. I think it's gotten a lot of unfair treatment over the years because, especially because of Follow the Wall, I think people were expecting that that was going to be an extension of the wall. Right. And in some ways it is. It's almost the beginning of the second disc on the wall, you know, after Hey You, where you've kind of got like the Vera Lynn, Bring the yeah. Boys Back Home. Uh, you know, that whole suite of songs kind of reminds me almost you could see the direction uh, that they were heading with uh, the final cut. But yeah, I, I, I like that album. Um, I know a lot of Pink Floyd fans don't. I know Pink Floyd, the uh, remaining, you know, three members after Roger left, uh, they yeah. didn't cover any of those tracks uh, in concert ever. I almost put Paranoid Eyes on, on my top 10 because I like that song as well. But um, yeah, I had to represent the album because I like it. Well, good. Yeah. Uh, I yeah, I can't argue with that at all. Uh, my number 10 song is going to be um, Cirrus Minor. Great song. Um, that is off of the Moore soundtrack, which I really like. Um, just a great way to open the album. And it's almost ambient. It's just very quiet. You've got some nature noises at the beginning. And then the keyboard picks up. And, mm -hmm. and David Gilmore with his just, you know, soothing uh, vocal. And it's, I don't know that there's any guitar on that song at all, which makes it odd for a Pink Floyd song. It's right. mostly keyboard driven, but I, I love it. It's just very atmospheric. And, you know, Richard Wright, I think always has been an underrated keyboardist. Um, you know, people talk about uh, Keith Emerson when they talk about great keyboardists or Rick Wakeman. Right. But, you know, Rick Richard Wright wasn't showy, but right. he definitely... He, was, he knew what to do, though. Yeah, he was an integral component to Pink Floyd. And I wish he would have gotten more of more due. But, you know, anyway, yeah. my 10. I like that choice, yeah. I'll have more to say about that album more later on. Uh, <laughs> All right, so my number nine, I, I wanted to pull a song off of Wish You Were Here. And like I said before, I, I, I'm not gonna pull Shine On You Crazy Diamond just because it's kind of split up. I love it though. Um, Welcome to the Machine uh, was in my honorable mention. Wish You Were Here, I like, but I don't ever need to hear that song again. So I'm going with Have a Cigar for my number nine. I was listening to it again today. It's funky, it's got a neat groove to it. And I love the part where they say, which one is pink? I just thought that's kind of cool. I like when bands kind of put their own name into their songs. Um, but yeah, it's got it's got a groove to it, which is really, I mean, this is an amazing album. And again, nothing, to, I, I like Wish You Were Here, this, the title track too. I love Shining You Crazy Diamond. It's just, you know, you hear Wish You Were Here all the time. Um, but Have a Cigar, just a killer song. So that's my number nine. And the only track not sung by a member of Pink Floyd. That's true. Yeah. Who sings that song again? Roy Harper. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. I should Ooh. know that. Yeah. Is that, the, 
Is that the when Zeppelin did Hats Off to Roy Harper? Is that? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yep, um, on their Led Zeppelin three album. Yep. Um, I totally forgot that he sang that song. Well, well, and there's a version on the expanded edition of Wish You Were Here. There's a version with Roger Waters. Um, okay. Put a vocal take for it, and it sounds terrible. Like okay. Harper, as strange as that seems, um, his vocal is perfect on that. And I can't imagine it any other way, but I, I love that song too. Um, Great song. Yeah. Yeah. I totally forgot that that was a different, that Roy Harper sang on that. Well, it still counts, right? As a Pink Floyd song. Yeah. All right. Well, that's my one mistake I'll make in this top 10 list. <laughs> uh, well, it's... Uh, you know, like I say, one of those anomalies. And I don't know how many people, you know, who are just kind of casual Pink Floyd fans even know. But, right. you know, anyway. Um, my number nine, I am going to go with Sheep off of Animals. Awesome. Love that album. Um, yeah, it, it used to, or at one time it was called Raving and Drooling when Pink Floyd were uh, composing songs and um Actually, I, I think they performed it in concert on their 74 tour, uh, mm -hmm. along with um, a version of Dogs, which was called Gotta Be Crazy. But nonetheless, it's such, uh, I, I love the driving bass. It reminds me a little bit of one of these days that uh, persistent yep. kind of bass riff off yep. the song, and it's got peaks and valleys. And you know, you talk about taking music, taking you on a journey, you know, where it starts off. I mean, when it, gets going i mean they they really uh rock out on that song and then it gets very quiet and you've got kind of those sinister keyboard um you know fills from richard wright and it's just I, I just did a video earlier today about songs that creep me out and that middle section of sheep where you yeah. kind of the it's it's almost like a horror movie soundtrack right in the middle of that and then you've got nick mason who He's yeah. got that really heavily processed vocal, and he starts reciting the 23rd Psalm, which they uh, kind of bastardize a little bit. And then the rhythm picks up, and then the song finishes out. And I, it's just such a, a great track. And um, one of the reasons why I, I love Animals, uh, that album to death. I love that album too. I think it gets lost though, because what was the sequence? It was Dark Side, and then was Wish You Were Here after Dark Side? Yeah. And, and then the wall. Yep. Right. So animals was between wish you were here and the wall. So I just think it kind of gets lost in the shuffle. Yeah. It's one of their forgotten albums for sure. Yeah. No, that's a great, I, you, you know, you could pick any song off that album. That's great. I love pigs on the wing too. That's a great song. Mm -hmm. Very cool. All right. So number eight for me. Yep. All right. Well, you showed this album before more. This is, top three Pink Floyd album for me. Like sometimes it's my number one Pink Floyd album. I love this record. Since I was a kid, I love this record. There's just something about it. Um, it's just got a sound and a magic and a vibe to it. Um, and a lot of Pink Floyd fans have never heard this album before. Um, but I'm going to pull the song, the Nile song off of here, which is probably the heaviest Pink Floyd song. And what's cool about that, there's a Canadian metal band called Voivod. They covered the Nile song. And, um, you know, that just goes to show you how heavy the song is. But the Nile song is amazing. And I know you pulled Cirrus Minor off of here. That's the first song. That's a killer song, too. But this whole album, it, yeah, I mean, that could be my favorite Pink Floyd album. It kind of goes between that and Animals. Yeah, no, I love Cymbeline off there. I love the Crying Song. Uh, yeah. The Nile is great. I mean, probably one of um, David Gilmore's roughest vocals. I mean, he totally yeah. uh, shreds that vocal on that song, uh, which makes it great. I think what I loved about this album as a kid, too, it was mysterious. I'm like, okay, so this is a soundtrack for a movie called More. But there was nothing about it, just these people here. I'm like, what the hell is this movie about? And I'm trying to like come up with the, the synopsis in my head. And it was mysterious. And I think that sort of added to the album. You know, there were no liner notes. It didn't come with any inserts or anything like that. And more is a, it's a foreign film. So. Right. Yeah. But yeah. yeah and they did always love the album. 
they did the soundtrack for Zabriskie Brisky Point also, although there wasn't an album made out of that. But right, um, it was another one of those where you know I don't think any Pink Floyd fan, even the hardest Pink Floyd fans, I don't think have seen any in um, La Vallée, which or however you pronounce it for Obscure right. by Clouds more or Zabriskie Point, but right. You know, Pink Floyd was doing a lot of uh, soundtrack work. They were busy with that early in their career, but. I've shown this album in videos that I've done and I've had people write me going, I'm a huge Pink Floyd fan. And I've never listened to that album before. So, which is surprising to me, but I guess some people don't go past like Dark Side or The Wall or Wish You Were Here or things like that. So, which I can understand why those are amazing albums. Um, but, you know, there's so much music from Pink Floyd that people need to explore. Yeah, and more is a gem. It's really an overlooked gem. Um, and I really, it's uh, kind of a chill out album for me a little bit too. You know, I, I um, will sometimes listen to albums as I fall asleep and just kind of like drift off. Um, yeah. And that's one of those, like, especially as you get near the end where it's just kind of more instrumentals and different right. soundscapes and stuff like that. It's like kind of the perfect album to have in the background, you know, right. if you're doing whatever you're doing, but yeah. And I just want to say too, before this video continues, I am not a Pink Floyd snob. Like, I don't care if somebody says Dark Side of the Moon is their favorite album. I love that album. Um, if somebody says Money is their favorite song or Another Brick in the Wall Part Two is their favorite song. Those are awesome songs. Like, I'm not a Pink Floyd snob. I'm not going to that those songs are terrible or whatever, but I just have certain songs and albums that I go to, but I love it all. And I'm, I'm not a snob about it at all, but, so I just wanted to make that clear just in case I do come across as a Pink Floyd snob. <laughs> but, sure, no, and, well, and even 10 years ago, my list would have looked a lot different because that would have been before I discovered more, before yeah. I got into a lot of the Sid Barrett stuff, before right. you know, I, I really, took a chance on some of those albums that just aren't popular and you don't hear on the radio and you have right. to discover on your own. And to tell you the truth, Dark Side of the Moon is easier to listen to as a first listen than more is, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. if somebody listens to more, they'd be like Pink Floyd sucks, you know, uh, because it's, it's just all over the place. Um, so yeah, I mean, I can understand. So just figured I'd put that out there. Well, I could not, I couldn't agree more uh, pun intended more <laughs> <laughs> but my number eight is going to be off of uh their debut album um a song called flaming that's and, a great song yeah i don't know you know many pink floyd fans that necessarily appreciate that song let alone this album um but for me you know sid barrett's got this playful teasing you know kind of a um singing the singing style that he uses the lyrics are very uh, almost naive and yet you know charming um in a way and yeah. i don't know it's just for me uh it's always been my favorite track off this album it's just got such a a charm to it and it's everything that made sid barrett great um just very unpretentious clever rhymes um, yeah. that he uses the way that he places the rhymes um, you know, like, no fear, you can't hear me, but you know, yeah. it's like where he puts the emphasis on the rhymes in the song is just yeah. clever and, you know, it makes it seem so effortless, but yeah, I got to go with that. I, I love that album, but I really love that track above all. It's a great song. I think the cool thing about Sid Barrett's lyrics, I think they actually meant more than they come across as you know they come across like you had said they are playful they come across as almost nursery rhyme mm -hmm. but it's like hidden stuff in there and that's what's cool about it so yeah. it's like it's like kids music but that adults can get into you know uh exactly of course there's drug references and then you know i mean arnold lane was about uh, uh a cross dresser who would steal clothes off the clothesline you know and here's this pop song about a crossdresser. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, I guarantee it's the only single ever released with that subject matter. You know, I mean, yeah. it's still to this day is so unique and so right. clever. And yet, you know, Sid Barrett was writing those songs in his sleep, I feel, because he wrote so many like that. And 
he, uh, you know, it, it's really unfortunate that he, um, you know, had uh, mental health issues because yeah. I wonder, you know, how much great stuff could he have written into the 70s and beyond. Um, have you heard his solo albums like the Madcap Laughs and, and all that? Yeah, the Mad Cat laughs, and that was actually produced by David Gilmore. So right. you know they they didn't harbor any grudge against him. I mean, I think um, you know some of that stuff is a little inaccessible, but yeah. um, you know there are moments on there. I, I really feel like you know Piper at the Gates of Dawn was as good as it got for Sid Barrett, and even like his second album, which was just called Barrett. Um, right. You know, there's a couple good songs on there, but and maybe I got to spend more time with that. Maybe I, you know, haven't. You're right. It's not. It's not as. Um, it's not as good as the Pink Floyd, Sid Barrett stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But um, well, that's a great choice. Mm -hmm. All right. So number seven, um, we're gonna see a lot of these same albums here. Here's Animals again. And uh, I'm going with the song Pigs, Three Different Ones. Always love that song. This is a lot like Have a Cigar. It's got this funk groove to it. Um, I love how they say the word charade, uh, charade. I love that. Um, and there's a kick-ass cowbell in that song, too. And uh, I've just have always loved that song. Um, they should play it more on the radio. Man, no, they shouldn't because then I would get tired of it. Yeah, I think they'd have to bleep out the effed up old hag. Oh, yeah, 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 that part. Part of it. When they say, ha, ha, charade, you are, that's just, it's just great. Well, it's funny, because the first copy I had of Animals was on cassette. And on cassette, because there's not enough space to have yeah. uh, that song fit on either side one or side two, so it fades out right in the middle. They stuck it at the beginning of side one on the cassette, and then it fades out and you have to flip the cassette over and it fades back in to hear the rest. Oh, that's strange. Yeah, yeah, it's really weird. And I, you know, I, until I actually got it on vinyl, I thought, oh, well, that must be how it is. They just faded it out at the end of sight, but obviously that's not how it was intended to be. This was, um, you know, another album where there was the mysterious factor too. I'm like, where is this factory? I want to go explore this factory. And then you open it up and of course, you see scenes from inside the factory and it just like the music just goes along with the cover. And I don't know, it's just that it's what made Pink Floyd so amazing. There was just a magic and a mystique to their music and their, their imagery. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, um, that, that was another thing that uh, attracted me to, the, to that album. Yeah. There's a, did you ever, have you ever seen the um, original Storm Thorgerson? Um, the, he did a sketch of what he thought the album cover should look like that Pink Floyd oh, yeah? ended up rejecting. Um, I've got a picture of it here. Oh, wow. That's totally different. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I don't like that. You know, this kid walks <laughs> in on his parents um, going to town yeah. And, um, but Pink Floyd was like, no, no, we like, that's not the, you know, that's not our vision for yeah. album cover packaging. But um, yeah, no, I'm glad they went with this one. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. Um, so number seven, it was one of your uh, honorable mentions. And this was one where it's like, oh, is it too much? But I went with Adam Hart Mother. And All right. It's, well, like I said, I almost put that in. So yeah, what I love about it, I love the sweeping grandeur of the opening motif, which kind of repeats throughout the song. You've got the, you know, like this brass fanfare. You've got the orchestration. You've got David Gilmore slide guitar, and it really takes you on a journey from where the where it starts. You've got a choir somewhere in there. Yeah. You've got a funky element on the keyboards. It's like everybody shines. Everybody's got their moment in the spotlight on that particular song. And there's even a middle part where it's almost like and it, this that middle part where it's just the whole weird um, sound effects and everything. Yeah. Yeah, that was almost like I can't put this in my top ten. But you know, there's so many other great parts of that song that I thought. Yeah. Uh, 
you know, I, I just, I love it. And I just, that's a great song to like drive to because there's so many, you know, it always keeps you interested. There's so many different parts to it. And I don't know how, I mean, it's easier, um, unlike Shine On You Crazy Diamond to differentiate what the different parts are. You know, yeah. I don't know on Adam Hart Mother, well, what's Funky Dung? What's- Right, who knows, yeah. What's the other, you know, the way that they kind of subtitled all those different parts to that song. But um, yeah, I've always, I, I've always loved that one. I know David Gilmore called it a load of rubbish, but mm. um, for me, I, I, I think it's one of those gems in their catalog. And it's really their first magnum opus that Pink yeah. ever, you know, a side long, epic track that they ever um you know attempted so yeah and to have it as the first song on the album it's like put the needle down and wow we're, we're hit with adam hart mother yeah yeah i was listening to that song in the car the other day with the kids because I, I kept debating whether or not i was going to put it in and my son's like who is this and i'm like this is pink floyd and they're like this doesn't even sound like pink floyd and then my son's like i'm guessing this wasn't a popular song of theirs <laughs> and like, no, it wasn't it's not a popular song i said but it's it's an awesome song it's a song that grows on you yeah ron geeson did the uh arrangements for uh that song and he doesn't really get much credit you don't hear much about him as yeah being a you know contributor to uh that album but and what's the deal with this i just pulled this out of adam hart mother this is an insert for a traditional bedouin wedding feast that came inside the CD. Did this originally come in the album, I wonder? You know, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I think that would probably was a, an original insert in the, um, the ver I've got two versions of the one that I pulled out. I've got this, uh, this is like the Harvest Records. Okay, uh, this is just a remastered CD version. But. Yeah, and I, it wasn't with this one, so I don't know. Huh. You yeah, know. I've always wondered what that is. So if any Pink Floyd fans out there want to let me know. I don't know if it relates to, you know, Alan's Psychedelic Breakfast or if it was just kind Maybe. of curiosity that they included in there, but. And what a great cover. I mean, it's just iconic. Like, yeah, it's the perfect picture of a cow. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. And, and you the, think like, like of all the pictures, it's like, hmm, let's put a cow on our album cover, but it works. Yeah. No, I, I you know, and that's what I love about, you know, Pink Floyd's album covers, with the exception of, the only Pink Floyd album cover that I don't care for are Obscured by Clouds and Metal. I think those are underwhelming, but all yeah. the other ones are just so uh, iconic and so artistic. And, you know, it's just, it, it, and it's great. And then you've got the the trio of cows. Right, on the back. Um, I always remember before I was ever on Pink Floyd, I'd go through, you know, looking at... Um, different albums and I'd see that and I'd be like God I wonder what the hell kind of music is yeah is that the version like on uh is that on the yellow harvest label yeah yeah that is I love that label it's uh there are other artists on the harvest label too yeah there were actually Thomas Dolby believe it or not um yeah I love that label yeah so cool I've got an album by Thomas Dolby that's also on the Harvest label, but um, okay. yeah, there's uh, many other artists that were uh, also on that one. Yeah, it's um, it's it, that was that was a great choice for a song. All right, so what am I up to? Number six here, it looks like. All right. Yeah. So I'm uh, I'm pulling out more again. And uh, I'm going to go with the song Green is the Color. I have always loved this song. It's written by uh, Roger Waters. I was listening to it again today. Uh, just folk, acoustic, beautiful elements in it. Uh, vocals by Gilmore. And um, it's, it's a beautiful song. Um, you know, again, is it going to rock the house? No. Is it going to, you know, I don't know. It's just. It's, 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 it's a beautiful song, bottom line. And uh, it's just always been one of my favorites. So I had to put that in. Yeah, no question. And, um, you know, it, a lot of people really thought like when Sid Barrett left, like that's the end of Pink Floyd. Like those other guys aren't talented. Those other guys can't write songs. What the hell are yeah. they going to do without their chief singer songwriter who was essentially, 
you know, the personality and the identity of Pink Floyd. And yet, you know, what a great songwriter Roger Waters turned out to be, you know, even yeah. Wright and, you know, to a lesser extent, Nick Mason, but they all just pulled together. They were, you know, it's like, we're either going to make it or we're not, but they- Well, and I think they had to change their sound because the whole psychedelic thing was sort of run, it's ran, it's run its course. Um, you know, you had the Stones trying the whole satanic majesty thing. And I love that album, but um, yeah, the whole psychedelic thing was sort of, uh, so yeah, it was time for Pink Floyd to kind of move into Pink Floyd 2.0. Yeah. But um, yeah, so green is the color. If, if, if people out there have never heard that song, definitely listen to that. It's good. All right. My um, number six track is to find the album here um god did i pull it for this episode okay i can't believe i didn't but um all right anyway so it's a metal album uh okay. it's fearless oh i almost put that in my top 10. yeah love that track and it's not in your face it's not overwhelming it's just such a great it's a um yeah, acoustic, kind of a lazy little track, but it's one of the first instances where Pink Floyd did that audio experiment at the end, like they did so successfully on Dark Side of the Moon and Wish You Were Here, where you've got, as a song fades out, you've got the football chants, you know, they're singing. Um, you'll never walk alone. Right. You've got the, the cheering, panning from the left side to the right side. But it's a great Gilmore vocal. And it's just a, a great little understated guitar riff. I just yep. love the sound. I mean, you crank that one up on metal and just kind of sit back and take it. Yeah. And it's just so perfect. And it's a great song. Uh, like I said, I almost put that in my top 10. Um, well, it's interesting that you mentioned metal because, uh, my number five is echoes. Uh, I put this album on today and I hadn't listened to metal all the way through, but I mean, one of these days, a pillow of winds, fearless, which you just mentioned, San Tropez, Seamus, which is kind of strange with the dog barking and all that mm -hmm. echoes ends it. Um, what is that sound in the beginning? It almost sounds like water droplets or whatever. It's like a ping sound. I don't know what that it's supposed to be. It is a, I believe it's a piano. Like they, they went inside the piano and they yeah. like plucked a, a string and they like put it through a, um, some kind of a, like a Leslie speaker or something okay. just to have it reverberate like that. Well, whatever it is, it's otherworldly. It's like a, from another dimension. And that's how the song starts. And as we know, it's 23 minutes long. Um, vocals by Gilmore and Wright. Different movements um, highlighting the members. Uh, midway through, there's this like psychedelic sound effect thing, similar to what they did in Adam Hart Mother. But it's more, I think it's more, a little bit more realized than um, Adam Hart Mother. Uh, and you don't hear people talk about Echoes that much, but it is an amazing song. Well, it's, it's only 23 minutes, like but it doesn't. But yeah, yeah. And you know, it it's 23 minutes, but it doesn't seem like 23 minutes. It, it's, it keeps your interest. Yeah, no, it, it's so, you're so right. And there's that metal section, it almost sounds like whales or something. You feel like you're underwater and that's the sound of the marine life yeah at the depths of the ocean and that's another track i used to play as i'd be falling asleep and you get that middle section and I, i'd be like fast asleep and my wife would wake up and the next morning she'd be like what the hell were you listening to what yeah. was that you know and i'd be like oh well it's i have to explain this echoes it's pink floyd and right 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 right. You no know, i totally know but yeah it's so fantastic and the, i don't know if you've ever seen the movie uh live at pompeii I've seen parts of it. It's been a long time since I've seen it, though. Yeah, that's a great way to hear and see that particular track. Uh, yeah. One thing that I really love about Echoes is that you've got um, 
Richard Wright and David Gilmore both singing, and I feel like their voices complement each other so well, like on yeah. the verses. And that's when I feel one of the biggest shames about Pink Floyd is they never utilized Richard Wright's voice enough because he was right. a singer, and you only hear him, like you hear him on Echoes, you hear, I mean, he had uh, like Summer 68 on the uh, Adam right. Mother song. And you hear him on, you know, harmonizing with David Gilmore on Time um, on the Dark Side of the Moon album. But he's got a beautiful voice. And I just wish they would have exploited, you know, just how well David Gilmore and Richard Wright's voices blended together so well. And I, and I, I was, that's a perfect example of that. I love it. Yeah, I think Richard Wright has at least one solo album that I'd like to check out. Yeah. Um, I can't remember what it's called or when it came out. I think, I don't know if he's got a couple, but. Is it called Wet Dream? I can't remember. I don't know if it came out in the so. 80s or, or not. I have no idea about anything about it, but I just know that there is one and I want to check it out. Yeah, because Nick Mason's is called Fictitious Sports. And I'm pretty sure, uh, I know Rick Wright had one called Wet Dream. He may have had another one or, but. You know. And what's cool about Echoes too, before uh, I'm done with this song, it's like, there's that craziness. And then the melody comes back at the end, almost like out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. That pinging sound comes back and it just, it kind of just brings it all back together. It's amazing. It's, uh, it's just a great song. So, yeah. yeah. No. Yeah, and the performance that they do at Pompeii is great because it's just that they, they fully utilize the motion, like they're behind the band and then they're circling yeah. in front and you get to see Nick Mason, what a great drummer he is. And they're just so stone-faced. They're just so concentrating on their instruments and their playing. It's yeah. a really awesome uh, concert from because there's no audience. They're just out in the middle of nowhere, these ruined yeah. Pompeii playing these great songs from metal. Um, and I've got to get that. I know it's on DVD. I've got to get it. Yeah, yeah. That and Magical Mystery Tour. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd recommend Live at Pompeii. You watch that before Magical Mystery Tour. But Okay, all right. All right. Uh, so number five for me is, I think it was one of your um, honorable mentions, but it was um, from this album and it set the controls for the heart of the sun. Yeah. Great song. Yeah. Just love that. Love the bass melody throughout it. It's just so hypnotic. Roger Waters voice is almost just above a whisper. Yeah. And you got this like creepy little keyboards in the background. And the rhythm is great too in the back. Yeah. It's like a rolling sort of drums. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, really good. I just love that. It's almost, it's, you know, like an ambient almost experience. Um, Brian Eno, I'm sure that was his favorite Pink Floyd song. But anyway. Yeah, I mean, Roger Waters can have sort of a creepy voice at times. Mm hmm. The, the timber of it and everything. It's, it's, it's good. Though. Yeah, no. And he's got, he's got a very theatrical voice. I don't have any, spoiler alert, I don't have any songs from the, the wall on here. But yeah. you, you think about like the song, The Trial, just how animated his voice gets. Yeah. Um, several species of small animals grooving with a pick from Uma Guma, you know, yeah. it gets kind of that, you know, uh, outrageous Scottish accent. And yeah. he's got so many different voices and so many different inflections and he just gets so colorful and animated with yeah. the voice, um, you know. Great stuff. Yeah, yeah. All right, so number four. I don't know if we've talked about this album yet. Um, Obscured by Clouds. Did you have something on your top 10 so far from this? I, I had What's All the Deal in my honorable mention. Okay, so I'm going with uh, The Gold is in the dot, dot, dot. Um, this is another one of my favorite Pink Floyd albums. I forgot to mention this before. Uh, this had the other, this had the mysterious factor of like, what is this movie, La Vallée? And I have no idea. And oh my God, there's a person in here. And I don't know that, and it opens up with a couple instrumentals. 
you know, Obscured by Clouds and When You're In are both instrumentals. Like who opens up their album with two instrumentals? But it is a soundtrack to a movie. So, um, but the gold that's in the rocking song on this album, uh, vocals by Gilmore. It opens up with a line. I love this line. Come on, my friends, let's make for the hills. They say it's gold and I'm looking for thrills. I just, I love, I've always loved that opening. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's just a great song. And this is another album that a lot of Pink Floyd fans have never really explored. Um, and, and, if, if, and if you're one of those people out there, definitely take a chance with this album, this and more. Um, they require some repeated listens, but uh, they're rewarding. And the song, but the song that I just picked, the goal that's in the, doesn't require repeated listens. It's going to get you right away. It's a great mm -hmm. song. I like Childhood's End on there also. And that's, you could definitely hear where they got the idea from Time, the sort of like yeah. the king at the beginning of that track. Um, and I like Free Four a lot too. Off that's that. a great song. I, I love the last hard. song no, that was too. On words. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, Free Four is on here as well. Absolutely Curtains, the instrumental at the end when, when they have the Aboriginal tribe chanting at the end of that. That is so cool. Yeah, it was like before David Byrne came along, you know, it was world music on a rock. Yeah. I don't know. So, yeah, I mean, that's another album. I, you know, but I'm going to just, I'm going to reference our Monkeys video. Like, I tend to go sometimes to the albums that nobody else likes. Like, you and I both like Monkeys Present. And if you ask Monkeys fans, that probably wouldn't even be in their top, you know, six or whatever. Um, but I tend to go to the albums that are lesser loved. Well, they haven't been played to death. You haven't heard them right. times on the radio and you haven't, you know, they haven't been overexposed. So, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, but that's my number four. All right. Well, I'm cheating on my number four and I know, you know, by the rules of the contest, one song per number, but, uh oh. And if I had to pick, okay, brain damage, fine. Just brain damage. I will take just brain damage. You can leave out Eclipse, but I love this from the first song. I heard it on my dad's turntable, you know, and I always thought the song was called Dark Side of the Moon. And so when I got the cassette, I'm like, wait a minute, where's yeah. it on Dark Side of the Moon? It's got to be on here, right? And then I realized, right. oh, it's brain damage. But yeah, so for, you know, casual Pink Floyd fans, the song you think is Dark Side of the Moon is actually called Brain Damage, but I just love, um, and they're in the um, movie Live at Pompeii, they have interspersed between the live segments, they've got um, montages of Pink Floyd in the studio. And they've got, uh, part of that is David Gilmore, and he's doing the kind of like these little guitar fills for uh, brain damage, which were never ended up being used, but um, it shows him in the studio at Abbey Road and he's got the backing track and he's kind of playing guitar over that, um, which yeah. I always thought was very cool. But yeah, I just, I love it. I think it's a, one of Roger Waters' best vocals, uh, a brilliant lyric. I loved kind of that little, the, the yeah. guitar where it just sort of floats off into you know the atmosphere um i love the melody i love the guitar picking which is like the dear prudence uh style of guitar picking yeah i just love everything about that so um brain damage and then if we're being a little generous brain damage into eclipse but definitely brain damage i'll give you eclipse on that um, well, like I said, when you and I were talking at the beginning, I almost put that on my list. Um, and I'm looking at the track list right now of Dark Side of the Moon. That could be the best song on the album. I mean, because, again, I don't need to hear Money again. I don't need to hear Us and Them again. They're great songs, but I've heard them enough. Um, I mean, Breathe is amazing, too. But I don't know. Brain Damage, you're right. That's a killer song. Mm-hmm. It could be the best song on the album. Yeah, it, it's mine for sure. Yeah. All right. Well, I pulled a song off the wall and uh, for my number three. And, it, you know, it's tough to because, of course, the wall needs to almost be taken in as, as a whole. 
and it's sort of take it's hard to take a song out of context but this has always been probably my favorite song on the wall i love the song one of my turns um in i was looking up some information it was the it was actually the b-side of another brick in the wall um but it opens up with those lines like i got a little black book with my poems in wait no is that the song oh I'm, I'm maybe I'm, nobody home yeah that's another song i like too but one of my turns is the one where in the movie where pink invites the groupie into his room Mm -hmm. uh, she's trying to talk to him you want to take a bath and all that and uh, then he just goes into this fit of violence just like destroying the room and the girl gets scared away but it's just uh it's a great song i love the imagery of that song and i love that because that's not one of the overplayed wall songs it's not like young lust it's not like another brick yeah. the wall. it's not like hey you it's not like comfortably numb you know, right. for those, it's on side two of the first album in that set. Right. And that, for me, I, I love where it's just kind of the, the keyboard, yeah, understated, Roger Waters, just the vocal and the keyboard. And then, like you say, it like totally kicks in. And now he's trashing his hotel room. He's yeah. in the groupie away. And he's, you know, admitting all of his vulnerabilities at the end of that song. I love when he's like, run to the bedroom and the suitcase on the left, you'll find my favorite acts. Yeah. I should have nobody's home on my top 10 too. Spoiler alert, it's not in my top 10, but I should have. That's a great song. Yeah. Little Black Book with my poems in. That's another great song. Yeah, I missed yeah. that one. I well, know. we'll do this in, we'll do this three weeks from now and I'll put that in. Yeah, if we had a top 20, that would definitely be in my... It's a my great song. Page. You're right, though. I mean, Comfortably Numb, I love it, but it's... Yeah. Well, for my number three, um, I got Pink Floyd albums scattered everywhere. Um, I'm going to go back to the Animals album for Dogs. Which nice. Love it. Such a great showcase for David Gilmore's guitar. Um, you've got the use of the vocoder... Uh, which, you know, the, the whole stone, 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 you know, going off like into infinity. Uh, you've got great Richard Wright keyboard passages. David Gilmore just shreds that song on guitar. Yep. And, and it's one of those, it's quiet and then it's loud and aggressive and then it's quiet again. And then it's loud and aggressive. And it's just, it moves through so many, you know, you've got David Gilmore on vocal at the beginning and then you've got Roger Water cleaning up like at the end of the song, um, kind of like they do on Not Now John, you know, where it's like yeah. you know, at the beginning and then like at the end, it's Roger Waters like singing the most biting lyrics. But, you know, and I just love the whole, um, you know, the, the lyrical theme, you know, the George Orwell's Animal Farm, how they incorporate yeah. that as the overarching yeah. theme of this album. But dogs for me, it's just so such a great sonic journey. Yeah, that's a great song. I mean, we could probably put the whole animals song uh, albums uh, animals album on this top ten. It's just an amazing cycle. Yeah. And that for and that album, it works splitting pigs on the wing. I think because it's short, mm -hmm. but it that works for me as an, an open and a closer. Yeah, more than Shine on You Crazy Diamond does. Because it's almost like a theme, you know? Right. And I know Roger Waters said, you know, without Pigs on the Wing, the album would just be like one long scream of rage. And so right. I wanted the book ended that way. So it didn't end on a, you know, a really dark note. Right. No, that's a great, that's a great choice. Well, we're down to the top two now. In the whole Pink Floyd discography. Wow. I wonder if one of us are going to pick another brick in the wall. Hmm. We'll see. Um, all right. My number two is a song called Julia Dream. And I heard it on the Relics uh, soundtrack. I was looking up stuff, not soundtrack, but the Relics comp. I was looking up some information. This is the first lead vocal by David Gilmore. Mm -hmm. on Julia Dream for Pink Floyd. Um, a, it's it's a folk psych classic. It sounds like it could have been done by Donovan. It's just got that vibe to it. And 
this album, like there's another cover of Relics that has like a machine on it. Yep. I've loved, I've always loved this cover. This was the first cover I ever saw. And it's for me. Yeah, it freaked me out as a kid because like you hear like Arnold Lane and you know Julia Dream and careful with that axe, Eugene, and like mm-hmm. listening to this stuff and you're seeing this creepy mask, and it's just like it messes with your mind. So I think that added to the mystique of uh, the album and the song, but Julia Dream, I don't know. I, cause I was looking, I don't think it was, I think it was just a single. I don't think it was on an album. No, it never was. Yeah. I was looking at Piper at the Gates of Dawn and Saucer Full of Secrets, but it's not on that. So I think it was just a single. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. But cool that it was the first uh, vocal by David Gilmore. Um, yeah. I always love that song. Yeah. I, I don't miss, I mean, I love Sid Barrett for what he contributed to the early albums, but I love David Gilmore even more. And I feel like they picked the perfect vocalist. I can't imagine there being a Pink Floyd without David Gilmore, not only for his guitar work, but also for his singing. Um, well, he had a smooth, uh, airy quality to his voice, almost cloud-like, you know, it was mm-hmm. just, uh, it was like you said, it was perfect for the music. Yeah. So yeah, Julia Dream. I mean, that's probably the most random song to pick for number two, but that's who I am. So Julia Dream. Well, and a couple of, you know, if you're a Pink Floyd fan and you're like, I've never seen that album before. I've never seen more. I've never seen Obscured by Clouds. I, you know, can't recommend strongly enough that you check those albums out because really you're missing a big piece of the Pink Floyd puzzle if you haven't heard those albums yet. And, yeah. you know, people think, oh, well, it was The Wall and Dark Side of the Moon and, you know, Momentary Lapse of Reason, Wish You Were Here. Like, yeah, it was. But before that, I mean, they really, uh, they were such an uh, interesting, unique and yeah. uh, talented band. And there are a lot of Pink Floyd fans who will come right out and say, I do not like the early stuff. Mm-hmm. I've read reviews where people said Pink Floyd was just fumbling around. They didn't have their sound. They were just making these long songs with no direction and, you know, the lyrical themes. And I don't know, I find it interesting. You know, I like things when they're a, a little less polished and um, it makes you, I like to, I like to work for the music sometimes. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't like to be hit over the head with a melody right away sometimes. I like to kind of work to like a song, you know what I mean? And I think that that's what those, and it, it, it requires repeated listenings, which I think is good because you hear mm-hmm. something different every time you listen to it. Absolutely. Keeps it fresh. Yeah, and I, you know, I can understand if somebody is like, oh, that's hippie music. I don't like it. It's too mellow. It's too yeah. unfocused, whatever label you want to put on it. But, uh, you know. And I can understand why people say that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's not going to stop me from liking it. So, yeah, I'm a fan. I know you're a fan. So, yeah. Um, my number two, a song we already talked about. So, I'm not going to, you know, belabor the point again, but I put Echoes as number two. Awesome. Yeah, love that track. Yeah, I could have moved Echoes up from number five, but yeah, it's it's a great song. It kind of has everything in it that you want from Pink Floyd. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, it's great. Yeah. All right, so my number one, huh? This is yep. good. Pressure's on now. Yeah, I'm going to have like the Pink Floyd fan club writing me like, how can you put that song? <laughs> well, you know what? I'm pulling another song off of uh, Relics. It's on this comp. It's also on, I just want to make sure I'm saying this. Yeah, it's also on Piper at the Gates of Dawn. Uh, Interstellar Overdrive has always been my favorite Pink Floyd song. And I think it's because when I was a kid, getting into Pink Floyd, I was really into heavy metal and hard rock. And that guitar lick on Interstellar Overdrive is just, it's just killer. It's heavy. And then it goes into this weird, like, psych part. Um, and then it comes back in blistering with that guitar. It's almost similar to, like, Inagata de Vida by Iron Butterfly. The song, I every time I listen to it, I hear something different in it. I just love it. It's, um, yeah, it's always been my favorite Pink Floyd song. And it added to the mystique of this album. I mean, all right, so am I the poster child for this album? Like, everybody, buy Pink Floyd Relics. 
And I seeked out like this is a this is um, there's later pressings of this, but I made sure I got one on the harvest label. Um, and uh, yeah, I've just always obviously loved this album. I'm picking like quite a few songs in my top 10. But yeah, anybody who's never heard Interstellar Overdrive, um, listen to it because it, it'll blow your mind. It's almost that you could argue that it's almost garage rock at the beginning, where it's round, 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 yeah. round, 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 round. You know, it's. I mean, who? Like, seriously, who picks Interstellar Overdrive as their, their number one Pink Floyd song? Like, you're probably think somebody's thinking, oh yeah, another brick in the wall, comfortably numb, you know, run like hell, wish you were here. It's a bold choice, but I love it. I, I love that you went out on a limb, picked an album that. Yeah, I'm going, and that you know what? We're that's off of their first album, Piper at the Gates of Dawn. So there you go. Yeah. That's where it all started. If it wasn't for Piper at the Gates of Dawn, there would be no wall. No, there wouldn't. That was the birth of uh yeah. Birth of it all. Absolutely. So there we go. I'm I'm expecting hate mail, but whatever. Or people will say, Wow, you're cool. You picked interstellar overdrive. So I don't know, we'll see. Well, I'll have your back on that one. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> for me, I'm going to go a little more um, traditional. And, you know, I had Shine on Your Crazy Diamond Part 6 through 9 on my honorable mention list. And I am going to go with Shine on Your Crazy Diamond Parts 1 through 5. Awesome. It's an interesting cover because the photograph here is different from the one that you've got on your CD. This guy, yeah. aiming man, is standing more upright. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, he's leaning. Now, why is that? I don't know. Um, this is on, well, it's on Columbia. Um, yeah. I, I don't know. I know this, is a, this has got to be an American pressing. And I don't know why the photo is different. I don't know if the photo was different in America versus North America versus the UK. And is this on the back cover of the al album or is this on the inside? Okay, yeah. Right. Yeah. I need to get that on vinyl. I don't have that on vinyl. Yeah, I've got this version and then I've got the the remastered, um, you know, the the one that looks like this with the sticker on it. Yeah. Um, and it actually came in a black cellophane cover, kind of like um, and through the outdoor Led Zeppelin, how that came yeah. in a paper bag. This one came yeah. in a black cellophane wrapper, and then you took it off, and then this was underneath it. Um, but I mean, but here, well, here you go, Jeff, because you brought it back to Piper at the Gates of Dawn because Shine on You Crazy Diamonds about Sid Barrett. Yeah, Shine. There you go. You D Diamond. It was like the you know Sid right there. Shine. Oh. You, you just blew my mind. I didn't, I never put that together. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to argue with you with that song. That song's, I mean, that's got everything in that you would want for a Pink Floyd song too. Well, and just the whole, the, the David Gilmore, it's the most melancholy, the do, 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 you know, that, like, I could listen to that like over and over. It's such, there's no way to put a finger on what makes it so great, but it's just such a uh, calming, you know, those four notes right there. And then yeah. you've got Pink Floyd after they recorded Dark Side of the Moon, they did an experiment, they were going to record an experimental album called Household Objects, where they just took normal household objects and yeah. recorded, you know, like made them musical. And so they did a track called Wine Glasses where they filled a bunch of wine glasses up with, you know, different yeah. levels of liquid. And then they'd like, you know, do like this. And so what you're hearing at the beginning is not a synthesizer, it's actually wine glasses. And oh. the expanded edition of the Wish You Were Here album, they've got the, the original wine glasses track that was gonna be a part of that aborted uh, household objects uh, yeah. album. And so, you know, right from the start, it's kind of, you know, very slowly the sound of the wine glasses list. And then you've got Richard Wright's keyboard melody, and then it just quiets down. And then, 
you got David Gilmore waiting in the background with the do do do, and then it just I don't know. There's so many parts of that album that I that was probably so. The first album I ever owned was Dark Side of the Moon, and then I bought the final cut, and and Wish You Were Here was a th no the Wall, and then Wish You Were Here. And so when I heard it, initially I was like, oh, I don't know if I like this. But over time, it's grown on me. And Wish You Were Here is my favorite Pink Floyd album of all time. And it's, yeah. I, I don't know, I love Shine On Your Crazy Diamond. Um, and, Welcome to the Machine. Yeah, Welcome to the Machine. Have a Cigar is great. And I love on that second side where... At the end of Have a Cigar, you've got the radio stat, yeah. you know, the, the person playing with the radio dial, and there's some, yeah. you know, uh, him going through the different channels, and then he picks up with uh, David Gilmore on the acoustic guitar, and then it, the, the swoosh. I, there's just, uh, it's such a clever album, and, you know, it all, it bookends with Shine On You Crazy Diamond, but the first part of that, I, I love that song. What's nice about Shine On You Crazy Diamond is it's a well-known song, but it's it's not overplayed. Like, I I mean, it's played a lot, but it doesn't have that overplayed quality to it, though. There's, mm -hmm. I think because it's a longer song, there's a lot going on. So right. it's a well-known song. It's a, it's a Pink Floyd staple, but it's it, I wouldn't put it into the category of, like, overplayed, though. You know, it's just a great song. Yeah, no, and that's a fitting tribute to, to Sid Barrett. Yeah, so everything comes back to Sid Barrett. Yeah, well, and I think it's Roger Waters expressing regret over how it all ended. And the most interesting story for me is the fact that, you know, when they were recording, um, I think it was Shine On You Crazy Diamond, but anyway, it was some part of the Wish You Were Here recording process. They were in the studio and in walks this overweight, bald guy who has no eyebrows and he's just- It wasn't me, was it? No. <laughs> He looked closer to me if I had no eyebrows and yeah. I were about, you know, 50 pounds heavier. And this guy's just wandering around the studio and they're like, who's this guy? How'd he get in here? And yeah. they realize it's Sid Barrett. He wow. walked yeah. way into the studio. And just let himself go. Yeah, they realized he was there. I, I know it was when they were recording Shine On Your Crazy Diamond because there was that connection there. And he wanted to know like, hey, can I play on the album? And he was just sort of incoherent and they uh yeah. you know, kind of ushered him away but they were like oh my god you know they hadn't seen him in so long and he looked yeah. really different he just really was in, not in a good way and um you know that really profoundly affected them to see him like that um yeah and i think that you know obviously Sid Barrett not only informed a lot of the songwriting on Wish You Were Here, but also The Wall about the, the burned out rock star who, you know, like you, you see that part, I don't know if you've seen The Wall movie, but yep. you know, where Bob Geldof is shaving his eyebrows, you know, that's Sid Barrett shaved his eyebrows, he shaved his head, he, you know, just totally uh, was disconnected from reality. And so even with The Wall, you have, the shadow of Sid Barrett kind of looming over the theme of that album. So he was always a part of Pink Floyd, even though he wasn't there physically. Yeah, right? absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, before we end, I want to show you another album that introduced me to Pink Floyd as a kid. Um, a Nice Pair. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, of course, this has um, Saucer Full of Secrets on it and uh, uh, Piper at the Gates of Dawn and some selections from uh, Relics and Umaguma. But at this time, it had it also had flaming, which had never appeared on an LP. Um, wasn't that in your uh, top ten? Flaming? Yeah, yeah, that was my number eight. But I wanted to make sure I got this, and this is I got the Harvest label version too. But um, I don't know, was this ever on CD? No. Fair. Yeah. They never issued it on CD. What's funny is my copy of that has a hype sticker over the woman's breasts. Yeah. The flip side of that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's obscured, but yeah. It's just so, I love, I always love the pictures on this. And um, yeah, so this was another um, 
early Pink Floyd album. And I think that that's probably why I like early Pink Floyd, because my first, I told you Momentary Lapse of Reason definitely, you know, got my ear going, like, who is this band? Then I went right back into Relics and A Nice Pair. So I was hearing the Sid Barrett early stuff. And I think that that's what turned me on first. Um, and then I kind of moved up and discovered the other stuff. Because I remember sitting on my bed listening to The Wall as well, like you were talking about, you know. I mean, the album is amazing. Um, and I would spend hours just listening to that album. Um, so, yeah, so this was fun. Yeah, just out of, just out of um, curiosity, uh, what's your favorite Pink Floyd album? Yeah. Um, Not to put you on the spot, but. No, like I said, more, I, I love more. I love Animals. Um, and I love the comp relics. Um, that's a tough one. Yeah, I think I'd go, but I also love Obscured by Clouds too. You know, I probably have to say more is my favorite album. I've just always had a connection to this album. I know it's kind of a random album to pick, um, but I just love Cirrus Minor, the Nile song, Green is the Color. Um, I like sort of the strange instrumentals in, uh, yeah, this is the repress of it. I like the uh, strange instrumentals on the, on the second side, like dramatic theme and main theme. And um, I love Cymbeline and it's just, it's such a cool album. Um, yeah, so I'd probably have to say more. Mm -hmm. Again, I always pick this, I pick Frank Sinatra's Watertown as my favorite Frank Sinatra album. People are like, why? Pink Floyd more. Why, Chris? Monkeys present. Why? <laughs> ACDC's um, Flick of the Switch. Flick of the Switch. Why, Chris? Why? <laughs> Why not Highway to Hell or Back in Black? I don't know. But yeah, well, it's interesting. Even like the song credits on here, you know, you got a lot of just Roger Waters yeah individual but there are five tracks on here that are credited to all four me members of pink floyd which is pretty i'm sorry um six actually because dramatic theme is also you got dramatic theme quicksilver more blues is ibiza bar main theme and party sequence all were four-way compositions which yeah. could be the last album to actually feature credits unless there might be parts of Shine On Your Crazy Diamond, but I, I don't think they're credited to all four members of Pink Floyd. And, I, and you'd mentioned, and I don't know if you pronounce it this way, but Ibiza, I'm not sure if that's how I pronounce Probably, it. Probably, yeah. But that's sort of like, a, that brings back the theme of the Nile song. It's a mm -hmm. song. So I thought that's cool too. Yeah, uh, I love that. I want to watch this movie. I've never seen it before. I don't even know if you can get it. On I wonder if it's on YouTube. Yeah, maybe. I'm sure there's like bootleg copies of it or something. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to go out on a limb and say Pink Floyd more. I mean, ask me next week. I might say animals. Um, but I just always tend to go back to more. Yeah. So, and the CD version, I don't have it here, but the, when they remaster the CD, it's cool because the liner notes explain the movie. Okay. They, pictures from the movie colored pictures and they tell the you know the synopsis of the movie so that was cool because then i could start to put the pieces together like why pink floyd chose certain pieces for certain parts of the movie um but yeah so what and you tell me yours was wish you were here yeah, yeah. i wish you were here and then my, you know my second it's always between dark side of the moon and animals yeah, you know, Dark Side of the Moon, I have to set aside the fact that, okay, you've heard it a million times and, you know, but I still, you know, I love Dark Side yeah. of the Moon. I don't care that I've heard it a hundred times. I could hear it a hundred more times, but Animals has slowly started to creep into my top three and yeah. it might even be, you know, in my top two on any given day, but I, uh, you know, and I love metal. I love Adam Hart Mother. I love more like you. It's just so hard to pick because there's so many great albums. But yeah. well, I tell you what, if I had to choose between these two to listen to, I would definitely choose Dark Side of the Moon because I'm just thinking this is an album you kind of have to listen to all the way through. And it's 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 a lot to take in. 
this is like you can put it on and just chill out you know yeah. so yeah i i mean i agree with you I love it, but i'm gonna be that jerk who picks more well so yeah that's what we love about you is you don't you know <laughs> you don't follow the expected path yeah yeah and that gets me into trouble sometimes too but yeah but this was this was a fun list. I really have to say it was hard. And even, you know, it was very difficult. A half hour before we uh, you know, got together with each other, I was like, oh no, I gotta put this here. And yeah, uh, you know, I'm gonna move this down or you know, I gotta put this in my honorable mention. So it, it's tough. Just like the monkeys one was tough. This one was also really hard too. Yeah. Yeah, no, and it, it was fun though, and it got it got us got me thinking and uh like i said you and i have been preparing for this since we were kids so you know you we've listened to these albums for years so um it's it's we're not experts but we're like we we know the songs so yeah exactly well and i'll just i'll, I'll add it on one creepy story is you know my dad was a pink floyd fan and uh he had the wall and he had dark side of the moon and um, when I was in high school, he passed away and he had all his vinyl that, uh, you know, I was too, I wasn't really so much into vinyl, least of all, you know, a lot of this stuff. And so, you know, my mom went to go give all of his vinyl away and she gave his copy of The Wall to my uncle and my uncle decided he wanted to pull it out and play it one day and both the records were gone. It was just the sleeve. The, the records themselves had disappeared. Wow. He's seen them said they weren't in any other album that we'd given hmm. away. It was just, it was one of those like, ooh. Yeah, sort of, you yeah. know, spooky little things. But um, yeah, I, you know, I, I've, I've still got fond memories of uh, Dark Side of the Moon and, you know, even The Wall, I, I think is it definitely got its moments. But um, how often do you listen to Uma Guma? I haven't listened to it in a long time, but I love of the drums and all their gear. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about the glare, but that's such a cool picture. Yeah, Uma Guma, you know, like if I'm gonna listen to anything, it's gonna be the live stuff. You know, Sisyphus, um, yeah. it's okay. I think um, The Narrow Way, like part one, you know, David Gilmore got some interesting uh, instrumental stuff on there. Um, you know, Grandchester Meadows, I think is a nice Roger Waters song, but it's yeah. hard because I, I can't listen to that album all the way through. I have to like, okay, well, I like this and I kind of like this. It's just, I, I think it's, you know, kind of self-indulgent, the whole solo stuff that they did there. Yeah, it's probably my least favorite of the classic Pink Floyd albums. I very rarely pull it out as well. Um, I mean, there's some interesting stuff on there and the live stuff is good. Uh, like you were saying, but um, yeah, like careful with that axe, Eugene is really great live. That's such a creepy song. Yeah, let's hey guys, let's jam out, and then in the middle of the song, I'm gonna whisper, "Careful with that axe, Eugene." How's that sound as a song idea? <laughs> but uh, hey, that's idea. what that's yeah. who Pink Floyd is, though. So, mm -hmm. yeah, this was fun. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining me, Chris. I really appreciate, uh, you know, a fellow Pink Floyd fan, you know, comparing both of our top 10 lists and, uh, you know, we'll figure out another band that we have in common. And, uh, you know, I hope we get to do this again real soon. Awesome. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate it. All right. Take care. Bye, guys.